Welcome, everybody. My name is Adam Petrikoff, and this is our October webinar in our Contemplating Your Exit series. I am super excited to have our guest today, Dr. Larry Gard, a psychologist out of Chicago, Illinois. We are on this webinar scouring the country to find the best talent and the best people to help us uh, in our search to educate our buyers, our sellers, and our advisors for business owners when they want to sell a business or as they contemplate an exit. So I'm the managing partner of VR Business Brokers here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, we serve the, the, the greater Charlotte and Southeast, and we are um, super excited about our guest. Dr. Garb, would you please uh, give yourself your own introduction? <laughs> Well, Adam, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you to the participants who are taking time today to uh, log on to this uh, this webinar. Really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Larry Gard. I'm a, a consulting psychologist, as Adam said, headquartered in, in uh, Chicago. Uh, my training initially was in the uh, psychology of older adults, which uh, back in the day we defined as anybody older than the chairman of our department. <laughs> But uh, throughout my career, it was working uh, usually with, with business people, but I wanted to figure out a way to also bring in some of my interest in the second half or the third phase of life. And so um, these days, my major focus has been on pre-retirement coaching, helping people try and figure out what they want that next chapter to look like. Well, great. Well, we're going to jump right in here. Um, I uh, am going to pull up the presentation here. Uh, of course, a good a good uh, guide would have had this ready, but you know, sometimes we uh, aren't always perfect. Okay, here we go. So here's our presentation. And before we get into it, the first thing I just want to remind everybody is uh this is we are not giving out specific psychological advice this is for information and educational purposes only so uh with that in mind um i also want to say that uh, please feel free to uh, provide any questions in the chat room or in the uh, q a and i will do my best to address them and finally i also uh failed to mention that uh, larry and i are both part of uh, the XPX organization, Larry in the Chicago region and, and myself here in Charlotte. And XPX is, stands for Exit Planning Exchange. And it's a group of advisors that are really committed to helping business owners, wherever they are in the stage of their business ownership, have a successful exit. And so one of the ideas behind this discussion today is really from my perspective, we're business brokers. We help people buy and sell businesses, but so many people do not take into account the psychological angle. They're always focused on the business or, or the money or their employees. And, and, and many times they just ignore such a huge, huge portion. So this is the overview for the day. We're going to let, let Larry go through some of these stages here and some mistakes people have made that he's seen in his practice over the years. But we're not going to read through every slide for those of you watching. Um, Larry's going to talk to it, give some stories, give some anecdotes, give some tips. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. So let's let's dig right in. So the decision to exit your business, obviously it's a personal one. It may impact your family. It may impact um, your, it may be driven by health, maybe by retirement, by burnout. But let's just, talk, let's just talk about the actual decision to exit your business, Larry, because that is something that usually, though they're not always, business owners can have some control over. Sure, thanks, Adam. Well, as you say, it's, uh... It's a decision and it's very much a process. It's not something that occurs, you know, that takes place over, over one week or one month even. And many years ago, I uh, was fortunate enough to collaborate on a white paper with Pete Chrisman, who many of, many of the people on this call know is a respected pioneer in the uh, exit planning uh, profession. 
And he started out talking about the, the three pillars of exit planning, the, uh, the first one being maximizing the value of your business, then tax estate and financial planning at the personal level, and the third part, determining what you'll do next. And when you think about it, any one of those things could take <laughs> a year or more to do. So most people in the exit planning profession talk about this process really needs to start three to five years before a person is planning to you know, exit their business. I mean, this all takes time. And of course, not everybody does start that early and not everybody really engages in the pl in planning at all. And to those people, what I want to say is, you know, if you own a business in the future, you won't. I mean, it's just that simple. There's no escaping the reality that eventually we all exit from our business, Ho hopefully on our on our own steam and, and not on a stretcher. But but leaving that role can be the most profound uh, transition in your adult life. And for many people, it's got almost the same impact as if they were leaving their family. I, I just can't overestimate the, the magnitude of this. Now, a lot of people feel like they don't need to focus on exit planning. They don't need to learn about it. As long as they're running a successful business, that's all that matters. Everything else will take care of itself. But just because your business is a success doesn't mean that you're going to exit from it successfully. That's why it's really important that you have a, a team of advisors. I mean, most business owners do this once, but people who, who are exit planning specialists, they do it for a living. And you wouldn't try and sell a house without a blueprint. Don't, I have to tell people, don't try and do this without a, a solid team. I mean, yes, you absolutely want to get input from your family. I, I know of a, an owner who really regretted that as he was going through the deliberations, he never really spoke with his wife about it. And she had some very valuable observations about his um, degree of readiness to, to sell. And I, I encourage people to talk with other business owners who you know who've gone through the process and ask them, you know, how did it meet with or diverge from the expectations that you had? But to, to your earlier point, um, Adam, about people not always focusing on the psychological side, you know, Pete Crispin, he noted that that third pillar, figuring out what you're going to do next, that's the most widely neglected one. And it stands to reason we spend years focusing on building up our business and, and making it a success. So we don't stop to think about anything beyond that goal attainment. But when we fail, your, when we fail to address that third pillar, it can complicate the, the exit planning process and the exit itself, and people don't achieve their, their goals. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the things we always ask when we meet with a business owner is, what are you, what are you thinking of doing next? What, what are your plans? And if someone says, I have no idea, my gut reaction is they're probably not really ready to sell. Um, they're probably just maybe thinking about it. They're, they're in the earlier process as opposed to someone saying, my, my, my wife or significant other, we're getting ready to travel. Uh, we're, we we we've want to go see the grandchildren. We're going to go spend more time at the beach. We're getting a, a place there. Is those that have specific plans, that, that tells someone like myself and other advisors that this isn't a wake up on Friday. I'm mad at my customers. I want to get out by Monday. This is, as you said, in the first bullet on this, this page is this is a process, not an event. And so as, as we put down here, you know, thinking about life beyond ownership, you know, I just read the other day, the average retirement after a business owner sells a business is 18 years. That's a whole nother career. Oh yeah. What are you going to do with that? You can only play so much golf. You can only, you know, so what are you planning to do? And, and when you talk about the spouse knowing or not knowing, they, they don't want you around the house all the time either. So you got to you got to navigate through these issues and they yeah, take time. There, there's an old, old line about, uh, I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch. Right. 
Right, right. So thinking about this, it's a process event. It takes time. Talk with your advisors, talk with family. People have been through this before, but we go into the next phase. So, okay, mentally we're thinking, and, and we're, again, everything we're talking about is from a psychological perspective, not a financial, not a business, but now we're going to start planning. And now we're thinking, okay, we are, we, we think we're ready, but there's all kinds of things that they got to confront or deal with or, or mentally um, they're, they're struggling with. So you want to talk about some of the, these issues here before we actually go to sell the business? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Well, I'd start out with the question, you know, how are we defining ready? I mean, ready doesn't necessarily mean that you're not without some discomfort. I mean, if you wait until that exit decision feels 100% perfectly right, you might be waiting a long time. I mean, don't, don't expect that this decision isn't going to be accompanied by some misgivings or un uncertainties. The, the key thing, I think, for, for folks is to use those feelings as, to, to help inform your decision-making process. Don't get paralyzed by the feelings, but use them as a signal. So, for example, Let's say you're debating about whether or not to sell. And, and the big question is, is this going to generate the kind, kind of funds that you're hoping it will? Or uh, will there be a, a buyer out there? Well, use, use that anxiety as a signal that, well, maybe it's time for an updated business valuation. You know, several years ago, I wrote a book called Done With Work, a, a dozen perspectives on the decision to retire. And I interviewed people who had chosen to retire. And one of the, you know, my hope with that was that it would help people who were grappling with this decision. As, as one of my respondents said, it's not easy to decide when to be done. I noticed that, that at least the people I interviewed, that decision to move forward, to leave their work, was really propelled forward when the psychological readiness coincided with uh, external circumstance. So when the emotional factors were in sync with the situational factors, that made the decision so much easier. But my point here is it's one thing to help people get their business ready to sell, but they themselves have to be psychologically ready. Now, in, in terms of the fa family dynamics, I mean, that could be a, a webinar <laughs> in and of itself. And, right. and probably there, there are people who are far more uh, far better experts on, on family businesses than, than I am. I will relate one, one quick story. Um, and again, these are not, I, I don't tell stories about my clients. I'll, I'll talk about people who've given me permission to, to talk about them, uh, who I've interviewed for the book. But, but I, did, I did hear about one woman who was a very successful business owner. Her husband had retired about five years before she did. And he was enjoying sort of an encore career uh, writing mystery novels of all things. But he really wanted her to, uh, to retire as well. He wanted to spend more time uh, with her and do some traveling. But she was really reluctant. And it, it turned out that uh, one of her assumptions was that if she retired, he would expect her to take over some of the same household duties that, that she had done very early in their marriage. And that wasn't on her agenda at all. Um, the point is you have to have those conversations. Um, you know, we all have personal and professional relationships and all those different people have opinions and needs and preferences regarding our decisions. And there are couples who, you know, may have spent years marching to the beat of their own drum, but now they've got to figure out how to play from the same sheet of music. And if people are running into some difficulty with that, or gosh, I even know of some people who even refuse to begin talking about selling their business or retiring because they know <laughs> that it's going to stir up a Pandora's box with their other half about, you know, where are we going to live? What's our lifestyle going to be like? You know, how much time are we going to spend with the kids? That sort of thing. But you know, just because there are those difficulties doesn't mean there's something wrong with your marriage. I mean, this is what couples counselors are for. You, you don't have to spend years <laughs> in therapy with them. It's very often, it's just a, a handful of sessions 
to get the dialogue going. You know, but again, a lot of us try and avoid having those conversations. But you know, when you think about it, how many times have you put off having a difficult conversation only to kick yourself for not doing it sooner? So cognitive ther theorist, uh, Dr. Robert Leahy, I think he's got a great line. He says that the disagreement we envision in our heads is usually far worse <laughs> than what occurs in real life. Um, in, in terms of the, uh, this ex exiting your business being a, a uh, look at looking at previous experiences. You know, this is a transition. And transitions are a little bit different than other life events. You know, and most things in life have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But the sequence is different with the transition. And a transition begins with an ending. This decision requires being psychologically ready to exit your old, your old life. And you know, some people do it gradually, others you know, want a clean break. But if you, if you really don't end the old, it's like you know, starting on a sailing journey with your boat still tied to the dock. So the, the average person goes through many different transitions in their life. And each one of those, we learn something valuable. So I encourage people, you, know, you might even want to make a, a simple chart that lists the different transitions that have taken place, and more importantly, what you've learned from them. You, know, you can use unsuccessful transitions too. Those, those have lessons as well. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, after grad school and residency, I decided to start a private practice, and it took well over a year to build up enough of a caseload to be able to support myself. And what, the, what I had to learn, the lesson that that transition period taught me was how to make use of my downtime. Well, can you see how that would be a valuable lesson to, to apply to post-exit? Very much. You know, the, um, in, in terms of the mortality issues, you know, Planning for the future confronts us with the fact that the future is not unlimited. And we look down the road and we see that it eventually ends. So many of us prefer not to look in the first place. What I tell people is, you know, planning may not change certain outcomes in life, but it can certainly make the journey a lot less rocky. Now, in, in terms of preparing emotionally, you know, I, I really encourage people to acknowledge their retirement worries. I think in many respects, we've, we've glamorized retirement you know, over the past couple of decades in this kind of, you know, when you, you think about the popular media, we see affluent older couples driving down the Pacific Coast Highway in a convertible or, you know, paddling a kayak in an ocean inlet, but, you know, Make no mistake, this is a huge transition for most people. And, you know, yes, retirement can be great, but it may also have some changes associated with it or losses associated with it. And we have to allow people space to talk about that. I've even had clients say to me, you know, they think there's something wrong with them because they're not overjoyed <laughs> with being retired. Yeah, they're, they're okay with it, but they see all these images telling them that it's supposed to be the most fabulous time of their life. There are a lot of other things that get in the way of planning for that, that period in our life. You know, we tell ourselves things like, well, I'll figure it out when the time comes. You know, maybe you never had a hard time figuring out what you do on, on the weekend or on vacation. It's great that you can occupy yourself, but as you suggested earlier, Adam, we're not talking about two days or two weeks here. If you're in good health, that post-work period could be measured in decades. And you, you, really, you really have to plan accordingly. Or I've had people say, well, you know, not, none of my friends seem to have given it much thought psychologically. They seem to be doing just fine. And yeah, maybe some of them did sort of move into that next chapter without a lot of psychological preparation. But you could be wrong. I mean, that, that activity is done privately. So we never really know how much effort people are putting into it. And, you know, that, that sense that they're doing fine can also be clouded by their efforts to portray themselves as doing well or, or your desire to see them that way. You also want to uh, examine the, the 
preconceived ideas that you might have about retirement. Uh, most of those come from what we saw other people go through, especially parents and grandparents. And you know, you may or may not have any role model of people who've successfully exited and enjoyed a, a satisfying retirement. I, I know I, cer I certainly didn't, which is probably why this topic's so important to me. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about, you, you read all the articles about the, the, the silver tsunami, the 10,000 baby boomers who are turning 65 every day over the next you know, eight to 10 years. And that generation is the highest percentage of business owners right now out there. And yet it hasn't happened like everyone's been expecting. And there hasn't been this flood of businesses being owned by people 65 or older going out to the market. And I'm wondering if, if you think, you're the psychologist on this webinar, if you think that that is partly because they're not dealing with this whole cycle a lot, that whole generation may not, they're, they're so focused on their business and their family and the lifestyle it's done that they're afraid to think about retirement and address their morality and, and prepare emotionally. Do you think that is possibly contributing to this? That, that could certainly be part of it. Um, part of it can also be the pandemic put a, a lot of things on hold for people. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the housing prices, yeah. you know, can, can be an issue too for, for folks. So the, the, the uh, no simple, easy answer. Yeah, yeah, there are probably many factors. Okay, well, let me go on to the next phase, which you know is where we start to get involved as a business broker, and 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 obviously, you know, the average business takes anywhere anywhere on average across this country eight to ten months to sell. Some go much quicker, some take much longer, and and yes, some don't sell. So getting through this transaction, lots of ups and downs, dealing with all these, you know, advisors, and that's just on the seller side. Now you got the buyer and their attorney and their financial advisor and their accountant. Everyone's poking and prodding and going through due diligence and going through a quality of earnings report. And everyone is asking so much of the seller. It's, it's a living autopsy. And so they get really high and low. And is this worth it? Do I want to proceed forward? Do I trust this person? They go through absolute psychological warfare with themselves. That's before they even ask me, what are my opinions? Uh, because we, we, we joke that we play therapist, we play a counselor, we play financial advisor, um, we play mini psychologists, but we're not, we're not any of those. We're just trying to be a resource because they got to get all this out of their brain. So talk about all the ups and downs and psychologically going through the transaction. Sure. Sure. Oh, you're right, Adam. I mean, that, that transaction, the, that phase is, is hugely stressful. Plus you also have to run your business. Correct. So, interestingly, um, what I've seen sometimes happen is one of the ways that that because it's so stressful, I've seen some business owners focus on their business as an escape, and to to a degree that that they're they're neglecting the transaction requirements somewhat. So you've got to find the right balance with that. But again, this is where having a team of advisors who you can count on is really so critical. They can help you anticipate what to expect with that due, dil due diligence period so that you can start to get <laughs> the materials ready. They can help you with the navigation, the navigate the uh, negotiation rather. Um, and there are going to be glitches and they, they can they can tell you what's normal. Yeah, yeah, the fact that a document was sent to the wrong email address or that the signature wasn't right. I mean, that that those things happen. And it's it's I think it's unrealistic to to try to maintain full control over every piece of this process. It's just there are too many moving parts. It's too vast. You know, all the various entities involved have their their own requirements and processes. And what I point out to business owners is, well, 
you know, I'm assuming by this point in your career, you, you recognize the importance of delegating things. Um, this is just another area where you have to have to delegate to your advisors. And that's why if you, you trust them, you, you should be able to rely on them. But it, it is incredibly draining. And you, you need to kind of carve out time for, uh, for, for self-care, um, you know, to uh, even if it's a, a three-day vacation, things of that sort, and to ask for help. Yeah, in, Talk a little bit about the, the loss of control, loss of identity, loss of the ability to go into the office every day. That's where they're sort of, you know, they're the owner. They're 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 in charge, and all of a sudden, um, that that's that's not going to be the case in, in the coming months. It's huge. You know, the the Reverend um, William Byron wrote that if you are what you do, when you don't, you aren't. Now, work really contributes to our sense of identity. It, it influences how we feel about ourselves and how other people view us. And owners are used to being in that role. They've spent decades in it. So it's perfectly reasonable that you're going to grapple with that. I remember one of the gentlemen I interviewed for, for my book, seated behind the <laughs> biggest desk I've ever seen. And he pounded the top of it and he said, for 30 years, the buck stopped here. And if I step aside, there won't be any more bucks. And he wasn't talking about dollars. He was talking about decisions, decision-making authority and responsibility. And he just felt bereft without that. This, this really is uncharted territory for, for, for business owners. So it's normal. It's absolutely normal to experience powerful emotions around it. Um, especially apprehension, fear, you know. questions like, you know, will I still matter? How will people react to me if they find out that I've exited my business? I mean, let's face it, when, when you meet somebody and they, they say, you know, so what do you, what do you do? And you say, I'm retired. The f nine times out of 10, the first thing they're going to say is, oh, what did you do before? Like your chopped liver now? I mean, right. So, uh, but when it comes to those powerful feelings, I think the four most unhelpful words we can say to somebody is, don't feel that way. Now we might think that we're reassuring people, but you know, feelings just are. You know, fears don't have to be rational. Emotions don't have to make logical sense. If they did, they'd be thoughts. Right. So. Well, I, I'd just like to touch on the last point before we go on on to the post transaction and, and some lessons learned over your career, the mistakes people make is whenever we meet with someone early on, they, they usually always just what's I, I want to get the highest price to so tell me how much the business is worth, give me an opinion of value. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting. Yes, the economics always matter. So I'm not dimin diminishing that in any way, shape or form. But as you get closer to the transaction, actually closing, there's less talk about many times money as opposed to the transition, uh, how they're going to ease the new owner. And, and sometimes, you know, that's when the owner is really confronting this is really going to happen. Like, what am I going to do with my next stage? And that's when, to me, it becomes a little bit more about them, their selves and their identity and what they're going to do next, as opposed to money. I'm not, again, I'm not saying money isn't important because it always is because um, it helps them fund their lifestyle going forward. But I've noticed that some of these, these soft issues really come up at the very end of the transaction because it is hitting these owners squarely that this chapter is coming to a close. Right. And, you know, some people struggle with that. So, well, let's and, talk about the post transaction. So, okay, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Business Owner closed last Friday. They're, of course, they're going to do their transition for a couple of weeks, months, et cetera, you know, three, six months, whatever the, the parties have agreed to. But now they've got some options. Let's talk a little bit about life beyond owning a business and, 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 and what are the things that come up 
that you see in your practice with owners post transaction? Sure, sure. You know, again, as you said, Adam, most people focus on on money, it, it, you know, during the transaction. But when you think about when when you talk to people who are retired, say in their first year of retirement. Yeah, I mean, now and then people might mention that, uh, you know, it's kind of weird being on a fixed income. But again, 90% of the time, they're talking about non-financial issues. They're, they're eager to tell you about the, you know, the new hobby that they picked up or the travels that they're doing or the educational pursuits they're pursuing. Or conversely, they may be talking about the negative things they're experiencing. They're, they're unhappy because they don't have a routine or they're, they're, they're feeling unsettled in a, in a, a new uh, living arrangement that they're not particularly pleased with, those sorts of things. So it's, it's not typically the financial piece that they're talking about at that point. And I, I try to encourage people to, to compare it to a really, a really, really extended vacation. When you think about the last vacation you took, you know, you, it might have been pre, pre-COVID, but you, you know, yeah, you probably thought some about how you'd pay for it and what the cost would be. But again, I guarantee you probably spent a lot more time thinking about you know, what you wanted to do, what you wanted to see, and how you wanted to, how you wanted to feel during that vacation. So I encourage people to think the same way about that post-transaction period. But, you know, sadly, the fact is most of us baby boomers spend more time planning our kitchen renovation or our adult child's wedding than we do preparing psychologically for that, that post-transaction period. And, you know, the, uh, sometimes people will say to me, you know, I have absolutely no interests outside of work. But frankly, I think most people actually do have interests. It's just that they didn't take the time or maybe never had the time to really uh, identify the interests and explore them. And for, when you start digging into that a little bit, sometimes the real issue is that there are just so many choices and that that gets in the way of figuring out what they want to do next. But I encourage people to think both long and short, short term and long term. You know, make sure that you have several things on your calendar during those first few months after, after you sell the business. The worst thing you can do is wake up on day one with a blank calendar. But, but longer term, you might want to start thinking about what was most fulfilling for you about work? I mean, we all derive different sources of fulfillment from work. And take that into account as you think about what you want that next chapter to look like. So for example, you know, did you enjoy the problem solving aspect of work? And if so, how, how so? I mean, did you like solving problems on your own? Did you like solving problems as part of a team? And then take that into account when you think about taking on other challenges. So for example, maybe you get invited to be part of your condominium board. Well, if you'd rather solve, solve problems on your own, serving on your condo board is not a good match, but maybe spearheading some special projects for them might be a better fit. Um, just want to share one quick quote from uh, one of my interviewees, a woman named Sharon. She said, I'd encourage people not to commit to any one thing initially. So many people I know have settled on one activity for their retirement, thinking it's going to be the right thing without really examining or exploring multiple possibilities. So I encourage that of my clients that, you know, a lot of times people are going to approach you with opportunities and want you to commit to things. Um, I encourage you to try and work out some kind of trial arrangement or interim arrangement with them because you really owe it to yourself to try multiple things during that period. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think one of the other things we, we mentioned here is that they're not alone. There's, there's so many of their colleagues who are also in this phase and it's really important to, um, you know, make sure you're, you're talking with your peers who are going through these same issues because you, you are, you are not alone. So let's, let's move into sort of some of the mistakes you've seen people make over the years. And, um, 
And I do have a, a, a couple of comments in here that I'll, I'll add after we get through the mistakes. So again, sure. if you want to add any uh, questions or comments, please put them in, in the chat or in the Q&A and I will get to them after this slide. Sure, the, uh, the, the, the first mistake is what we call it, adopting an R&D approach. And uh, the, it's not research and development, <laughs> it's repression and denial. And that, that title comes from my XPX colleagues out east, Paul Cronin and Jack Beauregard. And, and these are people who just won't even think about leaving. They avoid any discussion whatsoever. And that really leaves their company vulnerable uh, if, if things change or even if a, an opportunity arises. Um, another mistake is, again, we've been talking about this, uh, um, to, to, to being, not being emotionally ready. And this can lead to, to a sense of remorse. I mean, you know, these owners begin the negotiation process and then they, but they're not ready and they pull out of the deal. They risk losing money that they pay the intermediaries in it. But again, beyond the money, it creates disruptions for the different stakeholders and the, the business operation could falter. The third mistake is crafting unrealistic or ill-conceived plans for the future. Mm -hmm. and, and then these people end up feeling the exact same discontent and aimlessness that they feared to begin with. They end up sort of re-retiring because the first plan didn't work. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, I mean, I know so many people whose only plan was to play golf. And yeah, sometimes that works for some people, but in many cases, it's not fulfilling enough. And for the, for the advisors on this call, you may think that this doesn't, re, doesn't really affect you, but I think indirectly it does. If you use the, the, the analogy of, of a real estate agent, if that agent consistently puts people in homes that they're unhappy in, um, their clientele won't be satisfied. And I think the same is true if, if your clients find themselves unhappy in retirement, they may regret selling their business in the first place and they're, they're not going to be a referral source. Uh, another mistake is being blinded by our own history. You know, again, we have so many assumptions and beliefs about retirement based on what we saw our parents and grandparents go through. And maybe you watched a grandparent who, they, you know, they, they, they worked until they died or your parent became miserable after they retired. Well, you, know, you have to ask, are you playing those tapes? And is that getting in the way of, of, of uh, making plans? And finally, I'd say people have unrealistic expectations about how quickly the sales process will unfold and how quickly they'll adapt to the next chapter. And this might be the, the most important transaction in your life, and it might be critical, a, a high priority for your advisors, but there are lots of other players behind the scenes who may not have the same meaning to them. They may not be acting as quickly and, and this process does take time. And in terms of how quickly you'll adapt, you know, it's, again, I think it's unrealistic to think that it'll be any faster than six to 12 months before you feel like you've got your sea legs. The comparison I'd say is think of when you move from middle school to high school or high school to college. How long did it take before you really felt like, hey, I got this? It takes time. It's truly, um, you know, very, you just said a mouthful there. I mean, we could do a, a, a webinar on each one of these bullet points on this. Uh, we're going to move to the Q&A section. And, and um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but we have several advisors as well as business owners on this webinar today. And obviously, uh, in the future, people will be, be downloading and watching this on their own who couldn't make it today. And, and a financial advisor has posed the following question. If I could tell my clients one thing to get started psychologically, what do you recommend? I would recommend that they, well, boy, one thing is tough. I mean, probably the okay, one- we'll give, you, we'll give you two, Larry, give right. us two. The one thing I would say is, tell me about people who've sold their businesses and or retired that you know about, that you know of either in your own history or in your personal, um, network and tell tell me what they went through and and how you think that might impact your experience 
Um, the, the other thing I would ask them is how do you imagine, what do you imagine will be on your mind the most during the first six months after you uh, transition out of your work? And, and both of those are really just to start to get them to engage and start talking about the future as opposed to repressing it. Like you say, repression and denial. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a great question. Okay. Uh, another question here is um, talk about regrets and remorse a little bit more. So I'm going to let you expand upon that because uh, uh, th this this person appears to have had uh, a client uh, going through some regrets. And, and so what, what do you what do you think they do? And by the way, independent studies say that approximately 70 to 75 percent of people do regret uh, their transaction after it. It's not necessarily um, that they didn't get the right price or they didn't sell to the right person, but maybe they neglected this third pillar that we're talking about. So they don't have that identity. It's, it's not that the, the, they weren't happy they sold it for X, but it's, it's this whole new chapter and this whole psychology. So, so what would you say, di digging a little more into regrets and remorse? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you, Adam. I think, um, you know, yes, there may be occasions where people got a lot less than they than they had hoped they would, but um, usually it's because their life then at that point after they had sold the business is just not what they thought it would be. Um, and it, it, I can't help but think that it's it's because they had unrealistic expectations and didn't spend much time thinking about what, what that period would, would be like. Um, you know, you and I talked about when should this psychological preparation begin? And I, I said to you, well, really very early on in the, in, in the stage of the, the, the process of trying to sell the business, if you, if you wait till you know, letters of intent are signed and so forth, that train is starting to move already. Um, I'd rather see people uh, engage in the psychological preparation before they actually pull the pull the plug and and get things started. Or put another way, I, I'd rather people spend you know three to five sessions doing some pre-retirement coaching as opposed to having to spend six months of psychotherapy or even longer afterward when they're miserable. It's much, much harder to do that, that work then. And that is a great segue um, in, into, you know, I've, I've already had one person text me on my phone. I've been checking. He said, get me Dr. Gard's info. Um, so if you're intrigued by this and if you're another advisor and you want to bring, you know, uh, Larry in, into, uh, you know, I, I'm in Charlotte. I, I had to find the best resource I could find through my XPX network and, and Larry just happens to be in Chicago. So, um, but Larry has free retirement coaching programs. He's written a book. Uh, feel free to go to, uh, his website, uh, donewithwork.org. For more information, um, and I'm going to put up his contact information here again uh, as well, his, his email, his phone number, and if you, uh, I'll leave this up, if you, if you don't get this all down, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to give you uh, Larry's contact information, and um, Larry, this has been super, super uh Fantastic. I, I got to go back and watch this again because I was thinking so much. You, you had so many little nuggets in there that were, were so valuable. And so I really, truly thank you for your time, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your experience. It's, it's just greatly appreciated. And I think we both feel the same way. We're trying to contribute to help our clients and our referral partners have more successful exits. And if they're more successful, we're all more successful. And so thank you for helping advance that, uh, that further mission along here today. And My I pleasure. also, and I just want to let everyone know that next month uh, we're continuing our, our webinar series. Um, we've got a, uh, 
and, uh, another author, not just uh, Larry, but um, you can't really see it here because of my uh, green screen, but uh, Walker Dybo uh, has written a book, Buy Then Build, How Acquisition Entrepreneurs Outsmart the Startup Game. And so super excited to address it from a, a, a different angle from you know, helping people buy a business as opposed to start. Here we are talking about people exiting and the psychology. This is what we try to do in all these different webinars. And feel free to check on our website and our YouTube page for, this is about the 18th or 19th webinar that we've done with advisors like this. Again, our job is to try to help educate people so they can make the decision what's right for them and their family, whether on the ownership side and they're thinking and contemplating an exit or whether they're on the buy side and they're thinking of contemplating their exit from the corporate world or from, you know, leaving, you know, we live in Charlotte. A lot of people are coming down here. They're contemplating an exit and they want to try uh, business uh, entrepreneurship or acquisition. So uh, really excited for that next month. But Larry, thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you when I come visit Chicago. We will uh, look forward to, to catching up and, and thank you so much. And again, anyone who is interested in learning more, feel free to connect uh, to Larry or, or myself directly. And um, thank you all for your time today. And, and thank you all very much.